Okay, hello families and uh, congratulations on making a, a very important decision in your family's uh, education trajectory, um, thinking about and deciding coming to Bullis Charter School. We're really excited uh, to meet you eventually. And the aim of this Ask Me webinar is really ask us anything. And we're here to be a resource, um, a community of families uh, to answer any questions that you may have. And so thank you again, and we're excited to jump in. So I guess we'll move right into the next slide. Great, so this is a list of our panelists. We have uh, Maureen, our superintendent, who's here and going to ask answer a lot of poignant questions and a list of parents. We're gonna skip introductions of our, our parents tonight. Um, as they answer questions, they'll, they'll share um, information about where uh, their families go to school and their uh, children's grades. So I'm very excited. This is really fun to do. So um, please also utilize the chat um, to address any uh, questions you may have. We have families um, that are, aren't on video, but ready to answer your questions as well. So we can actually, yeah, move on to the next slide. Um, I'll actually pass it over to Melody. Um, actually quickly, Melody and I didn't introduce ourselves. My name is Jennifer. I'm a volunteer parent. I'm part of the new family engagement uh, team. And uh, Melody, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Oh, I forgot yeah. to say that I'm from North and I have a kinder and a first grader. <laughs> Go ahead, Mel. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Melody. Um, I'm uh, a Jen and Arrow team where, um, like she said, we're leading the new family engagement this year. Um, I have a second grader and a kindergartner at South Campus. All right, tonight's topics, uh, we will cover kindergarten, after school care, academics, extracurriculars, volunteering, connecting, and just some general questions at the end. Um, and if we do have time um, at the end, um, we can go over some of the questions that were asked um, in the chat. All right, um, first topic is kindergarten class structure. Uh, what is a typical kinder day like? Um, Anna and Randy, if um, you guys want to take the lead on this, are they online? I think, yeah, we'll just jump in. As mentioned, <laughs> Mel and I um, have kinders right now and first and second graders. So um, what is a typical kinder day like? Uh, we have, as you know, an AM and PM uh, class structure, um, a typical day um, with, within those hours, which is uh, morning. It's a nice early 8.15 to 12 o'clock. Um, and basically uh, it's, it's a mix of, of um, various activities starting off with circle time and the kids throughout the day have their own kinder version of co-curriculars, be it Mandarin, um, math and music. And um, there's a, a time for snack and a time for play but nothing really out of the ordinary. I think what really highlights and makes BCS um, their value add is that they um, they really mimic the elementary school and offering these really great extra or co-curriculars, I should say, around Mandarin, math and music and drama and such. And go, that goes the same with PM. I don't know if anybody else, uh, Maureen or Mel, do you want to add anything to the kinder day? Um, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, I think you, you covered pretty much what a typical kinder day is like. So I can move on to the next question though. I'm sorry, um, I'm gonna let, sorry, Anna, one of the panelists is trying to get, can you take the next one, Jen? I'll take the- um, For sure, okay. So what is the difference between AM and PM kindergarten? Um, basically the AM PM in that question just really is what the difference <laughs> is. There's um, not anything different structurally. Um, I think again, to highlight kind of where Bullis really excels is that the uh, kinder teacher in the class has an associate teacher who is a, a, a credential teacher who then is the PM teacher and then the AM um, teacher is the associate teacher. And I highlight that I, because um, it's rare to have two uh, credentials teachers uh, support the kinder program. And I think that's for me, what was really, um, really uh, fascinating and important when I was joint, when I was making my decision to join Willis. I'm happy to add one of the differences that I noticed for my child. Um, and this is a while ago, but um, my first one, I'm Elaine. Um, I have an eighth grader at North Campus. I have a, and a fifth grader and a second grader at South Campus. Um, for my eighth grader, when she joined, she um, 
one of the biggest differences, um, having a child who's very sensitive, um, have, going into the PM program with as a working parent um, is difficult a little bit in that there's two transitions um, for the day. So I think depending on your child, they may thrive better in an AM setting versus a PM setting. Thank you. Just given the number of transitions and the time of day that they're in school. Thank you, Eileen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, can, can you explain the classroom structure on Fridays when the AM and pin, uh, PM kinders are all together? Um, so in, in the kinder program, they add uh, 40 minutes actually uh, to the class schedule and it doesn't seem like a lot, but I remember clearly how that extra 40 minutes really, um, uh, I think makes a difference um, in in a family who has um, a half day kinder program and also for the kinder um, student um, themselves. Uh, so the structure wise is that there's some overlap, but there's still separate uh, classrooms that do their own activities. But there are areas where the AM and PM class interact like during circle time and such. But there again, there's independent opportunities too for each class. Um, just to build off what Elaine uh, was talking about, because we understand that our uh, half day kinder program is different from other local schools um, by timing and that there is a lot of times that added um, discipline and investment in an after school program, which I recently did. Um, myself, I went through, my son is in kinder now and I was a work uh, stay at home mom that recently uh, joined the workforce. So I freshly, freshly, um, my kinder just joined the Los Altos Chinese school, which is one of the, um, the, the schools that conduct after school programs in which they actually have a, a van that picks up your precious five-year-old or four-year-old or six-year-old and takes them to the after school program. And literally my son started uh, last week, I think it was, or this week, it's all a blur, but um, it is a solid program and it's a strong, I, I the transition went well. My son is not, um, does not speak Mandarin at home. We're not a Mandarin speaking home. I'm actually um, Korean American. So um, I, I encourage you to look at Los Altos Chinese School and other after school pro programs that are available for after AM and also before PM as well. I just wanted, and this isn't my question, but I wanted to throw one thing in about the Fridays having AM PM kinder together. I think it's really nice because it, the, it creates a connection to the entire school. So on Friday morning, that's also when we have assemblies and there are different things going on their houses, which is something that everybody's in a house and those houses go across the different grades. So every, so kinders have a fifth grade buddy and who's an older, um, who's like a fifth grade student who has like, or, you know, my, my kids had a buddy from, uh, who was an older kid and they got to know somebody who was in their house, who was in a different grade. And so the nice thing about having everybody there together on Friday morning is they can do that and have it be something common to the entire school, which I think is really cool. And it already builds that sense of like connection to the, the older, to the older kids, or it, I was, I'm, my kids have been at the South campus. So at the North campus, that's all the way up through eighth grade. So it's pretty cool to leverage the K-8 feeling. Okay, thank you. Uh, the fourth question, has the kinder program and structure changed due to COVID? Anybody else wants to talk um, about it? <laughs> I actually, I think anyone can address that the kinder program hasn't changed. And if someone wants to talk about maybe their experience as well as going from um, in-person to remote and in-person to remote again, um, I think this will apply and help families understand how uh, Bullis wonderfully and seamlessly transitioned into remote learning and back in person if somebody else wants to take this. I, I'm happy to add to that. Um, so I had, I have a second grader now who um, was in his kinder year when he, um, when COVID started. And so he transitioned um, that March actually on his birthday, I think, um, transitioned to COVID. Um, and I thought the, um, BCS did a really great job of transitioning from physical school to online. Um, there were a lot of the same structures put in place um, when he started. And a lot of his day actually on, this is on, in the Zoom world, um, was online. And so I think um, Bullis did a really good job of keeping it structured for the kinders um, so that they um, had a lot of the same 
offerings kind of offered pre-COVID um, in, a, in a COVID world. And then when he transitioned back to school, the only real difference was the masks. I think they did a really great job of trying to retain the quality of the program. So I think um, overall, um, the, the program is comparable kind of pre-COVID to after. Um, the only difference that I kind of noticed was he's wearing a mask and there's a little bit more sanitary um, protocols and things. And so um, the kids were very flexible and kind of, um, I don't think there's been a lot of, I, I think a lot of the things that kind of started to get a little bit limited um, through COVID just due to logistics and things have kind of been, have either come back or been retained throughout um, the COVID experience. Um, including things like the drama program, music and art, and making sure that those are still an integral part of the program, as well as um, the Mandarin exposure. And I'll add on to that, I'm Grace. I have an eighth grader at North, a sixth grader at North, and a third grader at South, and I have a 10th grader who um, also went through BCS. Um, and just to piggyback onto what Elaine said, if there are any concerns about the program um, Post-COVID, uh, I actually feel so confident in what BCS has been able to sustain with all of these changes by the week. Um, it's truly amazing to see how flexible the school has continued to be and has just offered the same quality and depth and the richness of the program, but just in different forms that align with whatever COVID protocol we have to follow for that particular week. So as Elaine referenced, the drama program and the choir program, they're all still thriving. And it, maybe it means that they have to sing outdoors or have to be a few feet apart from one another or you know they're masked for their performance but um i still see the same amount of joy in the kids as they go through these experiences and and are interacting with their teachers in person so it's been truly um such a blessing and the school has handled it so well okay thank you all right, moving on. Um, academics. How do teachers handle the range of reading abilities in classrooms? Thank you. I, <laughs> um, please tell me if anybody else wants to talk. Uh, I'm happy to take this uh, question. Um, as my son, as mentioned, is in kinder and my first grader was just in kinder. Um, you know, BCS is known for this individualized approach, and I see it through the cadence of uh, the teacher involvement in uh, bringing the parents in. And I forgot what it's called, guys, that the goal that we all do. Can someone remind me? It's called, um, you know, they have a set goal and they- the focused, focused learning goal? Yeah, the focused learning goal, um, which I really love. Um, even at kinder, they, and throughout uh, the school, you have a focused learning goal where, you already um, plant this framework of your child having a goal and taking, you know, steps to make that goal. It doesn't need to be like, you know, write a novel, but my son right now, it's um, to uh, learn how to skateboard. So you instill these methodologies and these philosophies in, 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 um, in the children young because we see them as independent learners um, with limitless potential. And as a result, the teacher, my kindergarten teacher, Ms. Subana, shout out to her, um, who was also my son's first grade, my first graders uh, kinder teacher, did a really great job in creating a cadence with us, uh, alerting us on his progress and giving us the opportunity to learn um, and also adjust as needed. Um, but that usually never came around because they were in tune um, with each child and letting us know based on different, um, I don't think it's assessments that they do, but they do, um, I don't know what it's called guys, but they do assessments around, go ahead, Grace. I, I think I it's called a DRA. It's, yeah. um, you'll find it in all classrooms, the, the directed reading assessment. Is that what you're referencing, Jennifer? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, at te teachers typically do this at the start of the school year with all subject matters. And um, they're really just wanting to figure out where the kids are as they're coming into the grade level and then making sure that they're able to differentiate so that they can reach the children and continue to help them progress and not just have them repeat knowledge or skills that they've already gained 
prior to starting in kinder. Um, and from now, my son is a third grader, so it's been a couple of years since I've been through the kinder program. But from what I recall, um, there's flexible grouping for the kids that are uh, for for the time period that you're working on reading and um you may have something that we might be more familiar with like a more traditional reading group where you can sort of see that the kids um who are at a similar level might be grouped together but then there's also flexible grouping so if they are working on a specific skill and um, they might pull kids from different groups and put them in a small group and then rearrange that again the following week when they're working on a, a different phonemic skill or that sort of thing. Um, so it's not set in stone and they definitely move around. And um, I think that uh, it's differentiation is always a priority for teachers. You've got such a range in, in all your um, content areas. And so this is something I think all, all uh, teachers at BCS are skilled at really being able to figure out um, what skill level their students are at and then addressing and kind of um, you know moving pieces around so that they can reach the kids and also doing it in a multi-prong approach so that it might not just be um, reaching the kids who are really verbal but also the ones who are learning um, through you know um, multi-sensory approaches um, so and you'll see that in all the different centers that they have not just the reading groups but also you know the word work or um, different tasks that they can do individually or pre-COVID was with the help of a parent and I'm not sure that that's come back yet but that's also a highlight too for parents is to be able to get in there and really help um, uh, decrease that, that student teacher ratio so that you can have multiple small groups operating at the same time. Yeah, and I, I could add to what Grace um, said. So I had three different kids coming in at different reading abilities. And so they do do the pretest of, you know, where where are they reading um, to start at the beginning of the year? And they, they use the DRA to kind of understand um, where each kid is at. And all of my kids kind of ranged at different um, different levels. Um, and I and I was a parent volunteer going into the classroom and, and watching kind of what was happening behind the scenes and um, what you can see with, with or without a parent. I don't know if parent volunteers are allowed in right now, but... Um, but uh, what I would see in the classroom is even without, because sometimes there'd be like four or five different stations happening um, and they're very small groups, but it's like peer reading to each other while the teacher's working with someone, while there's like, maybe they're doing some like learning app or something on an iPad. So there's many different centers happening where they can kind of put your, um, put your kids in the appropriate group too, so that the peers can support each other. The teacher can read to them in the smaller groups and kind of see what level they're at. And so um, she's the, the teacher to, to from all of the um, volunteering that I have done, I've seen the teacher kind of create these um, smaller groups within the classroom, even when sometimes it is only one teacher who's available. Um, and they're very creative in, in terms of what they can do in the classroom to kind of make those small groups happen. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, what are the expected milestones for kindergarten? Hi, everyone. Yeah. I'll jump into Anna. this one. <laughs> Hi, Anna. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Sorry, being late. Um, the milestones for the kindergartners, I think there is um, like every school has a program and the same, there is a specific program for kindergartners. Um, it's like, it's the, it works the same like for reading abilities. So first of all, like every child is tested at the beginning of the year and then teacher works in groups with um, kids and um, get them to the specific level as much as possible, get, challenge them if needed, or help them to go through uh, the gross moments. Um, I cannot say about the exact numbers or exact milestones like, yeah, this is what needs to be reached by the end of kindergarten. But I know definitely that kids are tested three, times per year and at each level they get better and better and during each trimester they work on specific skills 
um, including like um, the gross mindset, for example, and not only like academics, like reading, math, writing, but also something what like you cannot think about or work yourself. And teachers, I think, do a great job with that. <laughs> Maybe other parents can add something else to you. You know, I think what we'll do, and Alan, maybe you can confirm this with some of these uh, kindergarten quest questions. We do have um, a FAQ that we'll, we'll, we may send out afterwards um, to address anything we, we, we may have missed. Um, this is a collection of historical questions that were asked. So um, it's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to answer all your questions today, but we'll do our best and we'll follow up accordingly. So maybe we can move on to the next question. Thank you, Anna. Oh, Anna, you forgot to introduce yourself. Do you mind quickly letting us know? Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, yes, uh, I have two boys. Now they are in fourth grade and in second grade. Um, my second graders started TKK program mixed class. And um, yeah, it's been great so far. <laughs> We're both, they both are in South campus now which is much easier to <laughs> drop drop off and pick up. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Anna. <laughs> okay, Mel, let's move on to the next question. All right. As a parent, how do I talk with teachers about my child? Understand what they're good at, and what they're not interested in. I can take this one. Um, so the great thing about um, the structure here at BCS is there are actually two formal opportunities that parents can meet with teachers, two sets of parent-teacher conferences, one in, in the fall and one in the winter. But aside from that, the teachers are so approachable, and there's just this general sense on campus that if you have any concern or any question, any curiosity, that you can approach a teacher and um, engage in a conversation and learn more about the class in general or specifically about your child. Um, so uh, to take this question literally, if you're just wanting to know um, about your child's strengths or maybe some of the challenges that they're experiencing, if you just reach out to your classroom teacher, I'm sure that you would find that question easily answered um, through you know their experience with your child. Um, Jennifer, am I interpreting that question correctly? Just how to engage in um, conversation? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. definitely. Um, yeah. And also we use um, a lot of email communications between our class ambassadors um, that allow parents to stay informed. Um, class ambassadors are volunteer parents who help with the classroom and communications with the teacher. So there's com com communications coming from that end and also the BBC, which is our parent volunteer group. Um, so there's going to be a lot of great communication coming out and also from administration as well. Um, your the parents are able to follow up uh, with teachers directly with the volunteers. Uh, administration Marine is, uh, and the principals are very quick I shouldn't say quick, they're very responsive. <laughs> I don't wanna to put too much pressure on them, but there's always the opportunity to engage. And I think the biggest takeaway as Grace mentioned is that approach that they're very approachable. Um, and, um, and so you will have a lot of opportunities um, to talk to your teachers and the staff in general. Jen, can I use that to jump in here as well? Cause I think there's an interesting theme here. You all are doing a lovely job. Hi everybody, I'm Maureen. Uh, the superintendent with with Bullis. Um, it, these parents are great, first of all, like huge shout out to them on a Thursday night for being here and answering these really difficult questions, right? That are, as you're grappling with the right choice for your family. Uh, I think what I, I wanna highlight in being part of a charter and part of a school sort of hits this, the second question about milestones, hits this question about talking with teachers about what your child is good at, what they might be challenging. And I see some other questions just about curricula. And I think what I, I just wanna stamp is that um, the value or the benefit, and I've been in charters for, for a number of years. What I, I love working in a charter, what I love about BCS is that we have an ability to pivot quickly, right? As a small school, a small community, um, that means that our teachers know each other well. So the, the, the transmission of info about students from grade level to grade level exists. We know our families, we get an ability to connect as you've heard uh, Jen and others share about what it looks like for families. And you'll hear more about later too, about being in communication and being able to, to, to touch base with teachers. Those channels of communication exist and they exist too with our principals right in our school. So the hope is that all of us get to know your student really well, not, not after five or six or seven years here, but in that first year, 
which allows us then to think about things like what are appropriate milestones for your student? They may look different for your student compared to another student, right? When we talk about what an individual student needs and we talk about student growth, we spend a lot of time with growth. That means that we're really meeting each student where they're at and pushing them to that full potential. So that might look different for different students. And a big part of my work and the principal's work is helping support our teachers in differentiating that environment to really give every student what they need so that milestones, there definitely are baselines we want students to meet in kindergarten, but what does that look like and how might that differ for students depending on where they, they come to us with? And that's true for our curriculum, right? When we think about like what differentiates our curriculum, I would, I would say the, the broad blanket of that and you'll talk, hear more about our PBL units and really thoughtful things our teachers do, but ultimately our, our teachers' ability to pivot quickly and make adjustments based on what students' needs are. Whether that, let me pull this back and slow it down, we need to revisit, or how do I extend this and push this further to really increase the rigor here? I think that's something our teachers do a wonderful job at and that we're able to do well because we are a small environment with teachers being able to, to make those adjustments uh, a little bit faster in, in our community than maybe some districts have the ability to do. I could jump in. I, uh, my name's Chris. I have a daughter um, in first grade in Bullis North. And I know this question is specifically about academics, but in our two years at Bullis, our experience has been kindergarten fully on Zoom last year. And, and the question is, how can I talk to teachers about my child? So for me, the question is really about the quality of the teachers in BCS. And that's single-handedly the what has really got us through the pandemic and just what makes us happy as parents. Um, for example, last year when it was all on kindergarten, I honestly had my doubts. There's no way this five-year-old girl is going to be able to sit at a computer when the rest of us adults are not wanting to do the same thing, having to be on Zoom all day. But somehow she was super engaged. And I know all kids are different, all teachers are different, but our experience was that she was super engaged. She was teaching me how to annotate and get into breakout rooms for my own Zoom meetings <laughs> at the end of it. And, and this year I was, you know, the concern this year was, well, we're going back to school. How's she gonna be socially? It's a full school day. And, you know, there's different types of families, blended families, whatnot. There's different um, challenges that kids may have all individual, but, I don't know if it's just, you know, every teacher is different, but our experience was that on day one, when you do the, the welcome day, I think it was a few weeks or so before the school year started, we met, um, we met our teacher and she had maybe a four or five page survey that she had for all the families saying, what is your kid, exactly these, these, uh, these questions, what is your child like, what are their challenges? tell me about the family, tell me about, and then even during the year, as a year started, you know, communicating with all the parents in that class, you know, if the kid has a bad day, if they're going through something, definitely let me know so they can handle it. Not only just, again, like academics, this is an academic slide in the curriculum and whatnot, but you really get the sense that all the staff, all the teachers at BCS really look at the kids as an individual human being, not just a, just a student and in curriculum. So, in, in the in the case that all these questions that are popping up are about, you know, the quality of teachers and how do they see the students, it's been just um, really a, a bright spot for, for our experience the last couple of years. Can I chime in super quick? Um, I, I realized I didn't introduce myself. I'm Anne. My daughters are um, a fourth grader at South Campus and now a sixth grader at the middle school at the North Campus. And they've both been there since kindergarten. And ditto to what Chris said about the teachers being outstanding. We've had just a phenomenal experience with every single one of our teachers from kindergarten all the way through sixth grade for and different teachers for each of the kids. They haven't, they've always had a different, they've probably deliberately, they don't have having the same teacher so that the kids have a different experience. Um, they've been fantastic. I wanted to mention that there's a structured time that actually, so in addition to what Chris said, we've always gotten a survey at the beginning of the year asking, like, tell us about your kid. But also there's the October parent teacher conferences, and those are just a great time where the teachers had a chance to start to get to know the kids and they, they, you know, they, they're starting to see how they work, how they interact. And you come in in October and I've been amazed every time at how well those kids, those teachers know my kid already. And they can tell me, okay, here's what I'm seeing them working on. Here's what's good. And here's what we're proposing. They're going to work on for the year. That's where your focused learning goals come in. Here's what we're going to do for their academic one. I think she's doing okay in reading, but I want to actually have two math goals for her this year, because I think she could push herself there. I'm not worried about her. We'll keep looking at that. We'll do grades, but, but let's push herself in math and ooh, socially, what does she need to work on? Mm, okay. Yeah. She's got some anxiety. Let's talk about her social anxiety. What could she work on? What would that look like? 
this year. And so um, just really knowing my kid academically and sort of social emotionally. And then I found it super helpful. And there've been a number of times, like I've just reached out to the, I actually just reached out to my fourth graders teacher saying, ah, she's telling me this is happening in our class. And I think she's going to turn into a mean girl. How do I not make her a mean girl? And, uh, and so the teacher, like, in a day sat down with or like virtually sat down with me and talked through it and she gave me some strategies and how she would handle them in the classroom right so i just felt i feel very supported that if i need to reach out the teachers have always been really welcomed welcomed that and encouraged and like gone above and beyond just teaching my kid to help me figure out how to be a parent because lord knows we all need some advice on that or i do at least maybe you all have it all figured out but i'll, I'll zip it now but i i just can't stress enough how important that is to me because that's what makes a good school is its teachers and I think this school supports its teachers to be fantastic and to keep getting better so and I'll just yeah plus one to all everything um, everybody has said I mean I've had a daughter now is all the way up in eighth grade and I would say even between the years the teachers have done a great job because my daughter happened to be on the more sensitive side communicating between the teachers and just making sure that 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 information was kind of translating through the years and so they were challenging her where she could be challenged um, and kind of doing it in a gradual pace throughout a couple of at least her first um, years of elementary school so um, yeah we've had really great experiences with all of our teachers and they, they have felt like they've really cared about my child um, as well as, you know, they're always easily accessible and approachable as everybody else has already said. Okay, thank you guys. Um, we'll move on to the next question. General questions. The first one is, how does lunch work for PM kindergarten? Do I need to pack a lunchbox or buy lunch at school? There's no lunch at kinder. <laughs> so no need to pack anything. There's snack um, outside um, and playground time. So no need to pack a lunch. Yeah, just a snack. Yeah. Okay. Um, number two, what do you wish you knew before your child started kindergarten? I think we can open this up to everyone who had a kinder. If you can remember those days fondly, um, <laughs> uh, what, what did you wish you knew? <laughs> I can just add, I mean, I think, you know, going from pre-K or a daycare or even home, going to kindergarten is a really big adjustment. And I know that we were really worried for each of our children for different reasons. Are they going to adjust socially or academically? Is it going to be a challenge? And um, going into kindergarten, the schools are, the school, any school, I think that you kind of um, are going to um, be interested or looking around in the, in the Bay Area, um, they do a really good job of, you know, making sure that you're starting from where your kindergartner is coming from. Um, so all of that information that they're taking kind of in the beginning of the year at, at BCS, um, you know, through the forums, through the conversations, um, learning your child, I think we were more nervous about it probably than we needed to be. Um, knowing that, our, like knowing now that our kids are super flexible, our kids are going to adjust to any kind of rules. And, you know, even if it's very different from your daycare, your kid is very flexible and your kid um, are, is more resilient than you probably realize and give them credit for. So um, for us, it was just kind of, I think I would have, wish I had some reassurance that it would be okay and kind of understood that um, before going, um, before having our kids go into kindergarten. It, it, the adjustments were much I think greater for the parents than it was for the child. Great, thank you, Elaine. Uh, number three, what do most kids do the summer before kindergarten, the summer and summer after kindergarten? I don't know if it was kindergarten specific. I mean, we did some summer camps. Um, and I guess this also relates to number two, but I mean, I'm sure a lot of us, a lot of us here, me included, before kindergarten, I was a little anxious. Like, is she going to be behind? Does she need to understand how to pronounce certain vowel combos? And I did my, I guess, good parenting at home, trying to create a graph and a chart and trying to do some work at home. But looking back, I realize it's good to do that stuff. But in, in case any of you are kind of anxious or stressed out that they'll be behind or 
they need to prep. I mean, once she hit kindergarten, again, it was all on Zoom at home for us. So I saw the progression by the end of the year. I wasn't driving any of the uh, the curriculum. I, was, I wasn't focused on what she needs to learn. I was just letting the, the school handle all that. But sure enough, by the end of the year, she was reading, which I never thought would be, you know, I wouldn't, I would see she was reading on her own when before kindergarten, she was struggling on the combo vowels and all that stuff. So anyway, I would just encourage the, the parents, if you're entering kindergarten, to just have fun over the summer and not really worry so much. Um, and that was the advice that I got from a panel like this. And sure enough, that is the best advice. I'll, I'll just double down on that, Chris. Yeah, 100%. Let your kiddos, especially after the past two years which have been challenging, let them have fun this summer. Um, let them be kids. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get them where they need to be. Oh, sorry. All right, um, the last question for Kinder. What are some major adjustments kids go through during the kindergarten year? I think looking back, um, I'll just jump on this really quick and anyone else feel free to chime in. Uh, at, a, at that age, whether your child also comes in at TK age or K, um, I think adjusting uh, physically really makes a difference. I think that's why the half day has been um, helpful for us because um, it allows you to go home, eat, and your child can have their afternoon nap if needed. Um, and so that goes same thing with uh, the PM class. You uh, kinders have the opportunity to nap. Um, and I think for us, that was an adjustment um, that my son made, um, luckily in strides. Uh, and also 8.15, I don't know if, you, if the families here have more than one kid, um, adjusting the family and getting uh, the, the kinder at 8.15 because first and above is 8.30 and I think junior high gets in even earlier. So just ad adjusting um, family and home life to meet uh, the drop off and pick up, I think was also an adjustment for us as well. Um, but, but for Kinder White, it's, it's an exciting adjustment, um, everyone. It's, it's very exciting um, and bittersweet to see uh, your kinder um, your kinder kid, you know, join Bullis and go through, um, you know, joining a big school and make new friends and find a fabulous BCS teacher. I can only iterate that it's been a really great experience for my family. And as you can tell from the other families here, um, we may be a biased sample because we really did, we, we've had a really great um, journey so far uh, with Bullis because the families here are from K plus. And so, yeah, I think for me, that's my perspective. Anybody else wants to chime in? Um, if not, we can we can move on to the next slide, but feel free. Um, yeah, um, I think for um, us, it was uh, just um, kindergartners um, in the middle of the year, they do start getting homework. Um, and I think that's a major adjustment. Um, it's very light homework and it's optional, but um, it is, you know, assigned to them just to kind of get them used to, you know, doing some homework. It's um, very little, maybe like no more than 30 minutes per week. Um, so that's another adjustment. Okay, all right, we'll move on. Um, after school care. What are after school options for AM and PM kinders? I can jump in and answer. Um, I know several of them because I'm a working mom and I was looking for the options for our family. Um, so far, so there are like a couple of um, Chinese schools, which I know about one of them, Los Altos Chinese School. Um, second one is San Yu Learning Center. This is actually where my kids, um, one of my kids uh, went to. And the third option, which I know it's JCC. Um, for all of these options, you parents need to sign up pretty much now to get a spot because it's um, a really popular places. San Yu and JCC, I know for sure they can do a pickup from school and it's very convenient. Um, as for Los Altos um, Chinese school, I'm not sure because again, we didn't get to that. 
after school care and um, we can say. <laughs> I can add to that. Um, we had our, our kinders going to um, the JCC. Um, so, and we had them picking up from either North Campus or South Campus. Um, and they take a different route um, depending on which, which campus. Um, and I know that the JCC, at least historically, has offered both AM and PM. So they would, the drop off would then be at the JCC, and then they would drive them over for the PM and then pick them up after school. And they would pick them up um, along with the kids that get out around the 3, 315 timeframe, um, 4 p.m. And then for a.m., they would do the pickup around 12. Thank you. How are transportation logistics handled from school to childcare? Are there activities for students with two working parents? It's handled by the after school care, not by school. Um, what are the different things kids do? Sorry. Oops, sorry. Okay, what are the different things kids do during their non-school half-day time uh, that incoming kinder parents would want to know about? I'll jump on this just because I recently did this about two weeks ago during winter break. Um, uh, you can, there is a uh, preferred and um, I don't want to call them vendors, but there are uh, the Los, it's a Los Alamos Chinese school that has an actual van, as mentioned, that comes to pick up kids. There's also JCC and other independent private programs um, from around the area uh, that you can, that you can have your child attend. Um, I guess it really depends if you are a stay-at-home parent and have the ability to take your child. There's a lot of programs, as you already know, around the area, um, be it Kumon or RSM and, and those kind of programs uh, that, and piano and instruments that you, um, you can decide as a parent what's uh, best for your child. But um, from my knowledge, and I think people in the chat are answering some questions too, um, there's a handful of after school programs that address both the PM and AM gap. And um, I, I think that's all that comes to mind. If anybody else wants to chime in, um, but yeah, Los Altos Chinese School has been a pretty good uh, school for us. And again, we don't speak Chinese. <laughs> it's, been, it's been really great uh, for my little guy. I think Mel, you have, your kids are in yeah. something too, right? Uh, my kindergartner is at Los Altos Chinese School and he loves it. Um, yeah, he's learned so much um, since he started in September or August. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a great after school program. Yeah, and I just realized there's also Cornerstone and there's also Nine Fruits that I know I started researching as well um, when I, when we made the transition. Uh, mm -hmm. And Melanie and I will share our email addresses too um, after if you want to, if, if families have any follow up questions as well. I just want to quickly add, I see way to go Spanish and I know that one picks up and drops off as well. Cornerstone though, and somebody had said this ride shares, they don't actually do the pickup and drop off. So you actually have to um, have either other parents or um, a carpool going um, to drop off at the location. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Extracurriculars. <clears throat> So just a quick definition of extracurriculars. They're, they're basically extended day classes um, offered by um, BCS teachers. Um, some examples are Spanish, logic games, uh, art and drama. First question is what are the after school um, and or enrichment, enrichment offerings for K through third students on campus? So correct me if I'm wrong, I think the extracurriculars are offered beginning in first grade. Is that correct? And um, and they're built into the school day. They're free of charge and they're taught by your children's teachers that they've seen throughout the, the regular school day. And it's just amazing that if you have, if your child has a particular interest or wants to grow um, an interest in, in, in a particular area that's being offered, I think uh, there's a lot of choice that's left up, up to the teacher so that they can teach what they're passionate about. And there's different offerings on campuses. Um, based on the teachers that are at each site. And I believe they're offered Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for 45 minutes after the school day. 
Um, and my kids have taken advantage, all four of my kids have taken advantage of this. Um, the particular highlights would be um, the drama program. And they put on a production. Oh my gosh, it's just, it's spectacular. But there's, they break the grade levels down into three different productions and they do a fall one and a spring one. There's a play and a musical and there's a chance for every kind of actor or um, emergent actor to have some development in, in drama through their programs. And uh, it's just stellar. They put on four shows per production. Um, although I'm sure that we've scaled that down <laughs> during COVID. Um, but I can't say enough about the drama program and how it can bring out um, just confidence in every, every kid. Um, I think choir f falls in that category as well. Um, some of those Choir offerings are in the morning before a class, um, and then some in the afternoon. And again, it's just an amazingly rich choir program. Um, there's a winter concert and a spring concert, and there's so many parent volunteer opportunities. And you you wouldn't um, be able to guess just the number of kids that sing in the five choirs that are offered at, at our school. And I'll chime in on that. Um, ditto on the the strength of the drama and the choir programs, among many others. My kids, uh, who no no Grace's kids, because they're all little choir and 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 drama rats, um, in the shows together. Um, my oldest daughter. One of the reasons we actually liked Bullis is because we saw so many opportunities for public speaking and presentation. Because our daughter did not want to talk in public. She has social anxiety. You could see it even when she was four. She's you. She did not want to get up in front of folks. Um, if you know her now, you would not believe this because she she will she will talk and tell you everything that needs to be. She she yeah, she she's not shy now. Uh, but I credit a lot of that to the drama program and to what was going on the number of, you know, project-based learning and at the end of project you present. And so you just get enough practice at it that it becomes not a big deal. But she, um, she kind of, she was, I took, we took her to one of the plays and she's like, oh, mommy, I want to be in one of those maybe, but not the lead. I think, and it was the Lion King was the spring musical. She's like, mommy, I want to be in the Lion King, but maybe not the Lion King, maybe the Lion King's cub. And I was like, you haven't seen that story because that's actually the main part, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so she was in, as a kindergartner, she was like, you know, face painted a little and she sang and like danced in like two different songs. It was so cool. And the what I really like about it is it's all open to everyone. So this is not a place where you're gonna get cut from the show. If you want a part in the play, you need to get a part in the play. There are some limits, I think now with COVID, there may be some more constraints on that. But generally when you're not in COVID times, you want a part, everybody's gonna get a part of some kind. Um, and same with choir, you wanna sing, you're in. There are some options for like a, a, a select choir in addition, um, but, you get a great choir experience, even if you don't have any particularly strong talent, you're, they will work with you. So I just really appreciate the openness to everyone and they're really good. Like the productions are really good. Not just me as a mom, but like you listen to the choir and like, dang, how did they pull this off as a like K through eight school? But anyway, lots of opportunities. Mm -hmm. I was gonna add about like the, um, so my daughter, my oldest daughter was not big into the the drama, like the performance on the stage, but there's also opportunities to, to be, you know, a part of the production, be part of tech crew. Um, and so she really enjoyed the responsibility. And I do think like the confidence kind of comes through there because they, they trust these, you know, elementary school, school kids, I think starting fourth grade um, to run the behind the scenes of the whole play. And it's, it is pretty incredible to see, um, you know, uh, probably about 10 to 15 um, kids running the backstage, backstage, like tech crew, or like moving furniture around during some of these scenes and things. Um, but they have a lot of responsibility and, and they, they really uh, jump up and rise to the occasion. Thank you. My child is shy and I can't imagine them doing something like drama. How does BCS help? Can I speak to that? Because that was my daughter. Um, yeah. So one is they have drama in school and they have the most amazing teachers. If you've ever met Miss Pickett, everyone, it's like you've walked into a room and a rock star is there because the kids will start screaming her name and running over to her. But all the teacher, the drama teachers are really amazing. And so the kids have drama every week. And so they get experience doing this and they get encouraged to try things. And I think like our, 
Lilia was shy and the drama teacher talked about what she should, she should try to, she should try to challenge herself a little, or she should try to do something that's a little bit out of her comfort zone. And I think that's why one of the reasons, even if you're your kid or you're not that into drama, it's an opportunity to communicate that way of approaching life and approaching learning, right? Of like, we try things, we take some risks, they may not work, it's okay, it can be a little uncomfortable, but that's how we learn and grow. So those sort of life and philosophy lessons, you get them through drama, you get through them through your math class, but uh, there's a lot of personal care of the, and I think the teachers particularly take, um, take pride in finding the ones that are like maybe shyer or less comfortable and really helping them blossom. Yeah, and I can I can add to that. I think I had a similar child to Anne's, but um, kindergarten, yes, very shy, social anxiety, had a lot of issues, like in terms of even talking in front of her peers um, and in small groups and things. And so um, she she was a. It took her a while to kind of get out of her shell, but I think come second grade, she was since the drama is not just an after school program for those who are interested in kind of the school musical, school level musical, and the school level play, but there's also class plays for each of those grades before and um the drama teacher worked really hard with her to like work her up she had the lead role for her school play i mean for her sorry for her class play so that was like in the second role the second grade she was playing like the lead character i think it was like snow white in the snow white um play and it was surprising to us but she really got her to come out of her shell and you know even though she sounded ner or she she told us afterwards how nervous she was. She was so confident on the stage you wouldn't have even noticed. I think they've done, a, they do a really good job of kind of making them feel comfortable in front of their peers. And um, I'm not sure how they got them to kind of just ignore parents watching, but um, she did a great job. And we were, we were surprised by how well BCS was able to pull our kid out of her shell. And yeah, same thing T today. You wouldn't know that she was that shy <laughs> as a kindergarten. Grace would remember because Grace um, remembers my daughter from that year, but. I can chime into that as well. Um, my name is Zach. I have a, a fourth grader and a seventh grade girl. Um, I think uh, both my kids were shy, but we all know when we have our kids at home, they tend to act and uh, have little dramas in, in our houses. Um, Bullis did an amazing job of making our kids feel like a part of the community um, with their buddies and their co-curriculars. Oftentimes they have mixed grades in school. Um, so when they're performing in front of the stage, it's with their teachers and their family and their best friends. Um, they, they, uh, um, they, their parents and uh, teachers and everyone is in the, in the crowd rooting them on. Um, my, my kids were both shy about getting up in front of people and talking in front of them. Um, it only took a couple of years for them both to be kind of um, embraced by the whole school community. Um, my daughter in uh, 2020 actually got up on stage and um, um, applied to be the uh, president of the student body of the elementary school. And she actually won. She got up in front of the whole class and the whole school and gave her speech and the school voted for her. It was such a um, building experience for her. It's just, it's been an amazing experience for my kids. Great, thank you, Zach. All right, uh, last question. We have heard a lot of wonderful things about the drama and choir programs at BCS pre-COVID. How are these programs adapting and returning? They are adapting and returning as we speak. The um, sixth grade musical SpongeBob performs next week. There's four shows. It's gonna be outdoors. So that's an adaptation um, rather than in the NPR. Um, and then the choir um, choirs are ramping up for the spring concert um, in a venue that seats 700. <laughs> so we'll have to figure out how we uh, accommodate social distancing, but we, all, we sell out every show there. Um, so you can kind of get a sense for um, how the families just adore these performing arts opportunities at UCS students as well. Great, thank you. All right, moving on to academics. Is BCS Mandarin part of the regular curriculum or extracurricular? Does the program place native speakers into higher levels to challenge them? I, I'm happy to start in Grace. I don't know if you want to just yeah. um, qualify okay. some of this. I have, since I have the eighth grader and she's chosen Mandarin. So I think come middle school, come sixth to eighth grade, they can choose either Mandarin or Spanish 
as an option. My daughter's chosen Mandarin, so she's taken it all the way from um, kindergarten to eighth grade. My fifth grader, what used to be um, extracurricular and extracurricular in the morning, similar to choir, um, is now infused as part of the program. So the fourth and fifth graders actually still get that Mandarin exposure um, in their regular curriculum, where it used to be an option come fourth and fifth grade. Um, and so she's continued with it um, through her fourth and fifth grade, where, where it used to be they didn't have it. But, but a, a lot of it is to, um, to the later question of the native speakers, they challenge them at the level that they're at. So they have, um, they have multiple teachers and or multiple um, periods kind of um, offered for the different, different um, to differentiate between the different classrooms because there are more native speakers and my daughter, my, my kids are not native speakers. And so um, they tend to be in more in the, you know, where the broader, broader spectrum of kids kind of fall under, um, but they do do some differentiation. And my kids are also not native speakers and have taken Mandarin all the way through. I believe it's offered two times a week in the early grades. Is that is that correct for those of you who've got younger ones? I it was three. Okay. Yeah. Two to three times a week. And then um, it just becomes a regular class period, the world language mm -hmm. period, once they're in middle school and they elect uh, Spanish or Mandarin. And um, my oldest, who's now at Mountain View High, um, placed in Mandarin three as a freshman. Um, so, and again, without any experience speaking it at home. So I do think they go into high school. There was another question on the chat was how well prepared are BCS students for high school? And I would say they're very prepared to take on the, um, the rigor and the schedule um, at the local high schools. And I'll just add, my daughter is now, so my fourth grader is still taking Mandarin, and she did mention that some of her classmates, that they, as at Mandarin time, some of her classmates go to a different room, and she goes with one teacher, and some of them go to another room, and my daughter is not a native speaker either, so that they, they are differentiating, but then at sixth grade, my older daughter decided she wanted to take Spanish, and so she is really enjoying that program, like it's, she's actually, she's, she comes home and she asked me to get Duolingo she, so she can keep doing her Spanish, do more Spanish while she's at home. Um, so she's gotten pretty into it. So I think that's pretty exciting for her to be able to do that uh, regularly and get into it too. Um, I just appreciate, it's one of, also one of the things I appreciated about the school is the commitment to world languages. I didn't, I, whatever the language is, I wanted my kids to be learning another language, so. Great, thank you. Um, next question, how much academic pressure is put on kids? So I don't know how you all, I'm, I'm thinking of my own kids. I'm trying to think at different levels of uh, different grades. Like what is it, what does the academic experience feel like for my kids? So I think my kids have never felt pressure, like at school, they've never felt like, oh my God, my teacher's like, I need to work harder because my teachers are like telling me I need to, you know, do, 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 do whatever. Like, I don't feel like my, my kids have gotten like a pressure cooker feeling, um, I think depending on my kids, like one of my kids is more likely to put pressure on herself than the other one is. And so that one, I keep an eye on how she is, if she, I, you know, you know your kid and if your kid is going to be more prone to that, you keep an eye on them, you make sure that, yeah, they're getting, of course she's getting her work done, but I don't want her to get overstressed about it. And so I think about the balance there for her. I think one of the questions later on, this is about homework. So I can talk to that as well when we get to the homework piece about like, what does that look like for what the pressure is in school versus out of school? Um, yeah, I don't know, Others, other perspectives though. Yeah, I guess I would just loosely add that um, I think it depends on each child. So I also have a, a child kind of puts her own academic pressure on a lot of um, her, what she does. I've never really felt it, I think, on the from the teachers or the educators. Um, I think it's more so the kids and or, you know, if they are really severely underperforming, I'm sure there's some pressure that you're feeling. Um, but we haven't experienced ourselves. I know through COVID, I think some, you know, children had probably um, a little more difficulty learning through online than others and there probably felt there was probably some pressure there um, but on the whole I think I think it probably depends on the child and and their si specific situation but on the whole I haven't felt any pressure from teachers or the educators kind of um, who are you know like uh, for each of the teachers that we've kind of interacted with we haven't really had any of it hasn't been an issue I think 
Maybe one thing I'll add that I think is important is that sometimes when I remember when I was in school, it's like, well, you need, it's about the grade. So what matters is what grade did you get on that test or what grade I'm disappointed in you because you did, you got a, a B minus, you didn't get this, like, even you kind of sometimes see that from teachers or like, what did you get at the end? And if you didn't get a good mark at the end, then that was, that was a problem and you haven't done well enough. I think the approach that I hear from the teachers at Bullis is, have you learned it? And then if you haven't, they, after every test or not every test, probably, but like a number of tests, like my fourth grader comes home, they've looked at their test, they've reflected on it. And she's got a fourth, fourth grader. She has a reflection sheet that says, Hey, what did you do? Well, be nice to yourself. What did you, what did you think you made a mistake on? Okay. Here's your chance to make corrections and then bring it back, which tells me it's about what is, what are you learning? And if you didn't get it right on the test, it's not that shame on you, but rather they didn't learn that. Well, let's make sure you actually know it before we move on because we're here to learn not to get a grade. And I think that's super important because I do want my kids to learn. And I, I mean, I, I, the reason I would care about a grade is because it suggests that they've actually learned what they're supposed to. Uh, and so I appreciate that kids have a chance to go back and fix their mistakes and learn from it and then move on. Great, thank you. Next question, what are the homework expectations for K through five? I think they very, oh, somebody, I was just talking. So, so you wanna go, Grace? I was just gonna say, I think they might be evolving a bit, but the old rule used to be, you take the grade level and you multiply it by 10. And so you would have 10 minutes for first grade and night, 20 minutes for um, second grade. And then you add on 20 minutes of reading um, for each grade level. But I, I, I want to say that I, f I feel that the school is shifting in the direction of um, wanting to have meaningful work for the students and that the notion that there's been a lot of research that has shown that homework really isn't proving to be helpful um, in the early grades, aside from just the habit of of being able to sit down at home and, and get something accomplished and focus. But that busy work really isn't going to add to your academic development. And so um, I've definitely seen this in the middle school where in years past, I felt that um, my older girls came home and really were felt like they were sitting down to hours of homework. And, and now I'm not seeing that with my two middle ones. Um, and that it, it's purposeful and it's an extension of work that they were doing during the school day, but it's not just for the sake of doing something at home so that the school can say it's, it has, you know, the proper amount of homework per evening. So I, I'm not sure if that's what you're all experiencing in the early grades too, but I get the sense that BCS wants to be really intentional about the work that's coming home and that it shouldn't ever be a new skill that the then the parent would have difficulty teaching, but just uh, revisiting of something that they've seen during the school day and are practicing and, um, you know, leads to something productive for the next day or the next week. That, that jives with what I'm seeing with our girls, and I really appreciate that approach. And just as a concrete example, my fourth grader gets a packet on Monday that she has to hand in on Friday, and that packet has, like, each day, it has, like, an expectation to read for 30 minutes, which is just good practice. And then uh, like an exercise and for her, it, for her class, most of the time now it's been around spelling because they've been working on um, spelling and learning words. So that helps to have some repetition. So there's like a little spelling related exercise or crossword or something for them to do. Sometimes it would be a math problem or go on and, and do a little bit of extra like extension work on it, but nothing more than about maybe 15 minutes. It usually takes max or so, and it's due at the end of the week. So if you miss one night, you can catch up the next day, which I appreciate for flexibility because sometimes we've got a busy Monday night, but there's nothing going on Tuesday and you can catch up. So uh, I found it to be pretty reasonable. What, what I've noticed um, in our fifth grade classroom down at South was, and, and it may be kind of dependent on the grade, dependent on the, the teachers a little bit, um, but what I'm noticing is also um, a little bit more time during the actual school day to do some homework. So a lot of times my daughter comes home without homework. And I think um, the only homework she kind of has is um, trying to do the 10 minutes times um, the grade level in terms of like doing some reading um, at nighttime. But 
Um, usually her math is like done during the school day and things. So she doesn't actually come home with that much, um, which I think, I mean, has been good in terms of like trying to, you know, make the adjustment back to school, but then also um, giving them time to just kind of be kids. Yeah. Thank you. What type of testing is required in K through five? I can take this quickly. Um, there's the mandatory state testing that all public schools have to take. That's the CAST test that starts in third grade. But beyond that, the only other sort of standard, um, like regular testing is uh, there's a test called the NWEA and it's taken three times during the year at the beginning, in the middle and at the end. That test is something that the teachers use to get a pulse of what do kids know of like grade level standards. And so therefore, what do the teachers need to focus on or where my kids need already know or what they need to be like need extra help to learn. And then the mid year is like a progress check. And then at the end, it's another pulse check. So those are not like high stakes. They're not evaluative, but they give you us they give the teachers and parents a sense of where kids are on like math and reading. Um, and beyond that, the assessment, the testing is more like it's all related to the work they're doing. So it might be unit assessment. Did you get how much of that did you digest from the, the missions unit that we just did in fourth grade or the math, the word problems in geometry or something like that? So they're all very related to the work you're doing or a presentation for project base for a project. Thank you. Uh, volunteering connecting. Will there be any volunteering opportunities on campus? Um, so I think, Mel, there's two categories under that question. Um, one is in the classroom and the second one is at school. So um, in the classroom, and these are all starting to return. Um, we had to take a pause during COVID, but there's definitely opportunities to be in the classroom um, for the centers that we described in kinder. And those continue on through um, second and third grade, there are literature circles that are still led weekly and parents can come in and each lead their own literature circle with their group of, of students. Um, the parties happen, you know, throughout the school year for different um, holidays and events um, and the field trips. Um, my third grade son is taking a field trip to the Tech Museum on uh, next Thursday. And so they, there's always a need for chaperones and then just in school. In general, the lunch duty opportunities are there every day for you just to get a chance to connect with your child in the middle of the day and see who they're running around with and, and how they're socializing and also a chance to volunteer in the library. I just did that earlier this afternoon and it's so fun to connect with the students um, in this way and to see the teachers um, while you're on campus. Uh, I was gonna say that um, Aside from these opportunities, there are chances to volunteer at every level. You can organize um, all school events. Um, there's the walkathon. I think that Mel was a part of the team yeah. this year. Um, the fall family dinner is a tradition. There's book fairs at both campuses. There's an international expo that's coming up in May. Um, and then all the performing arts that opportunities that we mentioned, you really benefit from having parents behind the scenes and just offering extra pairs of hands so that everything runs smoothly and the teachers can just focus on their craft and the parents can deal with the logistics. But um, from what I found, volunteering is the way that you meet the community and how you forge your friendships and how you um, get a chance to see your child in action and you know what their day looks like and what, where they're, they're thriving and where they might need a bit of support. So you get that little window when you're volunteering and you also get the chance to see the teachers in their element and just really be astonished at what they're able to do day in and day out. One little uh, insider information that uh, I had for uh, kindergarten is uh, when we signed up for some of the uh, kinder volunteering efforts, the teachers would usually send out a message saying on a, Tuesday night at 5 p.m. signups will be available. And I remember my wife signing up for field trips because we were always interested in doing that. As we were signing up, other people's names were going in at the same time. So just shout out to people that are here tonight that um, you want to get on that list early if you want to be a part of it because they're especially popular in kindergarten. And um, so far I've done, I think I volunteered at Master Goals. I did a bunch of field trips. Um, I've done lunch duty recently, and that's one of the things that came back post-COVID. Um, I got to go into uh, 
into kindergarten and do a kind of career day presentation of what I do for a job. Um, I've heard of other classrooms, you know, we have some amazing parents at our school. I heard of a, uh, a heart dissection by a cardiologist in one of the classrooms. Um, there's, um, and anyways, just uh, all kinds of opportunities to volunteer in class. Thank you. Second question, why is it important to volunteer? I think Grace said it, it's uh, a chance to see your kids in school and a, a chance to interact with their classmates. Um, I'm very rarely known as Zach at Bullis. I'm known as either Owen's father or Tessa's father. Um, and it just, it makes you part of the community of the school. And you get to see how your kids are learning. I get to see the challenges my teachers have with my own children. Um, I get to meet a lot of parents and families. Um, we've gone to Europe with some Bullis classmates. I was skiing with another um, group of classmates last week. Um, it just makes you part of this, the uh, community. I'll echo. Think, oh, sorry. To cut go me. ahead, Grace. No, go ahead, Grace. But, um, the caliber of the program at Bullis is so high that there's inevitably a need for um, for assistance beyond just what the teachers can provide. And, and I think it helps the teachers to know that they can count on that sort of support so they can offer these just amazing chances. You know, there were a group of students and parents who traveled to Fresno, I think it was two weeks ago, for, uh, because the choir sang for a California music educators conference and gave a 30 minute um, performance. And so and you need parents to be able to make those opportunities happen. And, and that's just, you know, one but many uh, examples of things that take place in the curriculum. Yeah, I'll echo that it's a community effort. Um, and there's a very small practical example um, of why volunteering is important. For example, you know, my first grader started going to school and bringing lunch. That was new for me. And there's certain thermoses or lunch boxes that or packages she had trouble opening. And she's like, oh, there was a there was an adult to help me open that. So that's kind of heartwarming, right? So like we all need to kind of pitch in to um, raise the experience for all the kids. And honestly, if you want, this might be a stretch, but this is a personal opinion. Just we've lived in a world where it's a lot of like not in my backyard type of attitudes, you know, last couple of years, last five years, call it whatever people have their own opinions, but this kind of shows all the kids that it's normal. It's normalized to foster a community. So I think it's, there's a higher value to all that as well. Awesome, thank you. How do BCS families get to know each other and stay, stay connected? I just spoke, but I'll say it's maybe not even under your control. I mean, just yesterday I'm a parent reached out to me saying that the two kids had already scheduled the play date for Sunday. And it's just on us to formalize it and put it on the calendar. So um, yeah, again, the communal aspect and just the kids spending every day, every school day in such a warm human centric environment, I think it just fosters a lot of social interaction and, and friendship. So I've, I think Randy, who was supposed to be on the panel, like I've gotten to know him very well um, and just, you'll, I think it'll just happen organically, but again, I'll leave it for others to answer on like if there's any formal channels, but I've, I've gotten to know more parents than I thought I would, honestly, at this point. I'm going to also add, I mean, I think especially through COVID, <laughs> parents have gotten creative to kind of get to know each other. We are having technical issues, trying to log into Zooms and being able to kind of ping and reach out to other parents was kind of essential to getting into the classroom sometimes and things. And so um, there are some formal channels like WhatsApp, group, WhatsApp groups. I have that for each of my kids. It's like whenever we have a question around kind of that um, that grade for that child and or get, getting um, keeping up to date with, you know, some of the spirit days and things like that, we'll get those reminders via the WhatsApp, group, WhatsApp groups, um, which has been helpful in staying connected with families and kind of knowing what's going on in the classrooms. And if you forget a reminder, you miss something in one of those, um, one of the school comms or the teacher comms, um, there are reminders and parents have each other's backs kind of in that way too. 
And pre-COVID, there used to be um, a gathering per class per year that would be organized by someone. They would volunteer to get that going. And there were also casual ones that would just be held in like downtown Los Altos and would be by the grade level, like for example, in the middle school. And if you had time from nine to 10 after drop off, just pop into this coffee shop and hang out with one another. And so those were really nice ways to um, be able to keep the connections ongoing. And also bear guides. I, I don't know if the BBC is still offering that for the new families, but um, that was a was a wonderful avenue for pairing up a current family with a new family and even giving the students a chance to get together before school so that they would know a friendly face um, and then just provide um, answers to questions throughout the school year and opportunities to see one another. Great, thank you. I don't know, Mel, if you just want to quickly talk about to affirm that we are doing um, bear guides this year, if you want to talk about it a little bit. <laughs> um, sure. Um, yeah, we are doing the bear guide program. Um, it's where we pair um, current families with um, the new families. So um, each of the current parents who volunteer um, will get assigned um, maybe three to four new families. So um, they'll have a chance to meet each other and um, if there are any questions, they can go to their bear guide. Did you want to add on or is that pretty good? Okay. All right, we need we should move on. I know we're running out of time. Um, all about BCS, these are just some general questions. Uh, number one is what would you consider to be the biggest strengths and weaknesses of BCS? Sorry. I'll go. Um... This is just like an interview when they when they say, well, give me your strengths and weaknesses. You can't just say there's no weaknesses. I wouldn't call it a weakness, but something that was glaring for me, and this was something we had to weigh in the uh, when weighing our options, was, you know, if you've gone by the campuses, they're they're in a bunch of portable buildings. Now, granted, they're very well taken care of, well organized, and it's great, but. You know, I think a lot of us have maybe gone to traditional schools or I mean like uh, public or private schools with a large campus. So if that's really important to you, know that there's no traditional large campus, but you still get all the, I mean, as an adult that has gone through a school with a large campus, you'd notice it, but I'm sure the kids don't notice and they love school. But, you know, that's honestly one of the things about BCS that I said, oh, well, you know, they kind of have like, a campus on portables, it's fully functional and very comfortable and very safe and all the great things. It's just when I compare it to my experience, that was a difference. But the way I kind of put that in the back of my mind is again, all the great things kind of massively out, outweighed that. And at the end, at the same time, you know, high school campuses, college campuses, there's plenty of opportunities to really thrive in a large structured building and campuses. So it's just, to be quite honest, that's the one thing um, that was not not in the pros column, but you know, the pros column was very heavy. So that's kind of where, where I netted out. Um, I'll say, I'll throw in, by the way, it's funny that we're, I, I think we're all like, we probably all have a million strengths that so we've been talking about them a lot, but I will, I will share, I think this is, this is important for like candor, like, all right, what did you think about might've been a drawback? So for me, looking at kinder, um, the half day kinder was a major drawback for me. I was like, for real? Like, I have to figure this out. Like my kids have been in full, full day care since they were like three and a half months old. So I know they can handle a full day. And that was really hard. And it just, I mean, part of the reason that Willis has a half day kinder is because they don't have the space from the district to get out of portables or to have, um, or to have like full day kinder for everybody. But, um, so that was something I seriously thought about. I'm like, for real, I'm going to have to deal with this. And then, um, I decided that having one year where it was a half day and having to figure out the aftercare was worth it for the long term because then starting in first grade and beyond, you have a, you have a longer day and you have a day that supports having art, music, um, drama, PE, uh, Mandarin, like in every school week. Uh, that was so worth it to me to have that that longer day and that we're like fully integrated. I'm not going to have to take my kid out to go get a music class to know that she's getting access to music or whatnot, right? Um, so that to me was what made it worth it to like, all right, I'm going to deal with the hassle of a half day kinder for a year because long term, I know this is the place that I want my kid to be at. Um, and not just because it's a longer day the rest of the 
first through eighth grade, but because I was so impressed by the teachers, by the way the school ran, the culture, the supportiveness, the individualized attention, the project-based learning, all the stuff we've been talking and chatting about. Um, yeah, as Chris said, like huge number of things that outweighed the negatives. I mean, it also helps on that note, I, I'll I already spoke, but every, I wouldn't say every, but just knowing that you have to enter a lottery, right? You're not, it's not that you just live somewhere and you're just placed in a school. Like almost all the families that have kids that go to Bullis, they've made a conscious decision to want to go there. And that honestly may not show every day you drop off and pick up, but holistically that really shines through. It allows the staff and teachers, in my opinion, to do what they think is best for each individual student. And just, again, knowing that you're next to a family and parents are picking up their kids that entered the lottery, that probably had their fingers crossed like we did, and that were very happy to get accepted and have a spot. That makes a huge difference. And in my opinion, if you look at public schools or private schools, again, just speaking my own experience, um, just kind of picking up, dropping off just because it's school, right? Like every family seemed to have made the conscious decision and the choice to want to try to get in and, and, and probably wanted to get in and are happy that they got in. So that makes a big difference in my opinion. Well said, Chris. All right, thank you. What is the Bullis Boosters Club and why is it important to join? Um, the Bullis Boosters Club is the Parents Association um, at Bullis, and it's the premier uh, volunteer uh, vehicle and also the organization um, that brings the community together. And so it's important to join so that you get a chance to meet, you know, all of these parents that you're alongside with for nine years. And um, and I feel that the BBC is, is always uh, being conscious of ways that they can create community across two campuses and ways to bring these families together even if they're not seeing one another um, from day to day because they have kids at south and they have kids at north and it's amazing um, how many other ways you can still intersect and feel that you're you, you go to it's one school um, and there's you know just different sites Thank you. Number three, how does parking drop off work in the morning? How much time should I plan for waiting in line? Someone asked this question on the comments and I responded back saying I had the same question before the school year. I said, there's no way you have hundreds of kids dropped off within a 15 minute time span to be, but I mean, we all fall into our routine. I know exactly when to leave. I know exactly when I'll get there. So it's, the drop off doesn't really, I mean, if you have your routine, I, I bet you're gonna find the right time to leave and just stay on your routine. So a little bit of trial and error, I think, uh, first couple of weeks, especially if you're just, if you're new to the school. Pickup's a little different. And I think all the parents can, can understand. Um, there's a line, it depends on if you wanna stay in your car and the kids come into your car, or I, there are a lot of us, me included, that kind of park in the neighborhood, or if there's a spot, if I go early enough, and to go pick up our kid and, and walk them back. And, and there's a lot of people, honestly, that live in the neighborhood, so they'll always be walking. The one thing I'll say is that on, on rainy days, uh, you should make your adjustments because it could be a, a long uh, backup. But I think that's anywhere. It's not just Bullis, it's probably every school. Great, thanks, Chris. Okay, number four, aside from location, what are the differences between North and South campuses? South is kinder through five and north is kinder to eighth. And so when the fifth graders finish at south, they move to the north campus for the middle school. Um, there's a size difference, clearly. Um, so families uh, who go through the south campus just have a slightly smaller group of students. Um, 
and then they still get a chance to experience the North Campus when their kids go into the middle school. Uh, I've got kids um, split and it, it's actually possible. You can go from one campus to the other in 15 minutes. You can do drop off at one and get to the other one. You can do pick up at one and get to the other one and it, it works. And if it doesn't work, there are so many families that are doing that that you can find a carpool situation. Awesome, thank you. All right, um, that's it. Um, thank you um, so much to uh, incoming and potential um, interested families. Thank you for those who've already accepted and just super curious to learn more. And um, we ho hope this continues to affirm your decisions. And those who are on the fence, as we know, I think we're in the timeline for them to turn around is tomorrow. So I hope this, yeah, okay, uh, helps um, address any questions you may have had. Um, and that if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to email Maureen, uh, no, feel free to <laughs> email uh, Maureen Allen and you have a slew of contacts for you guys to reach out to. We're happy to address, I hope this signals just the community ahead of you for those who have chose BCS and for those again on the fence that, you know, that we, uh, we are all very happy and we're all once in your shoes before and just wish everyone the best in their decision making process. And I don't know, Maureen, if you want to say any last comments as we close. This wonderful Thursday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, you all did such a lovely job. I, it's it's nice to sort of just sit back and, and listen. I think that often I, I have to jump in and lead Zoom meetings, and it's so lovely to have so many great parents here just advocating for and speaking on behalf of Bolus. And I think what they all shared is awesome, right? It, it's not magic that it's a bunch of really great families and really great teachers committed to, to doing what's best for kids. And I think that's why I do the work every day. And why I love working with Bolus is that we just have such a committed group of educators, of families, of students, all driving towards that same mission together. And so please know that like we want you to be part of that family and we know it's a big decision. So just like Jen said, just like everyone said on this call, if you have questions, I dropped our, our office number and our email in there. Please reach out tomorrow, especially knowing this initial wave. If you did get that initial offer to enroll, that, that deadline is tomorrow. So don't hesitate to give us a call. Our registrar, Lisa Pankin, is fantastic and can answer questions you have or direct you in the right direction. We want to make sure this is the right fit for you, too. So thanks for taking so much time this evening and joining us. Grateful to all of our, our parents, too. Thank you all for being here on a Thursday night. Really, really appreciate it. And Maureen, if you field any more middle school specific questions, feel free to send, put those folks in touch with me or I'm sure Anne and um, Elaine would, would jump in, too. Because I know we yes, didn't need as much time to that. Absolutely, yeah. If there are any specific ones that come our way, I'll definitely forward it. Thank you, Grace, for naming that. Awesome. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, guys. Thank you.